Yeah, yeah, this is weird. weird. <laughs> really out with that. You guys are usually back there. Yep. Why the move? Test in the water. <laughs> okay. Because we didn't set up camp here. <laughs> no. This is the only class we have. So. Now I now I feel like a little bit uncomfortable with you guys being up front. I feel like it could be some sort of ploy. You guys are gonna <laughs> so the, the uh, first class I ever taught, um, the last day of class, last day of lecture, the front row showed up. This is at UW. They showed up all wearing flannels, and I I wore flannels like every day in grad school. So this is. Um, like an attempt, like, like they, they were like kind of like laughing throughout the lecture, and I was like, I was not picking up on this at all, the entire lecture. And then afterwards, they came up and they all like had a, got a picture with me, like a whole row of students with flannels on. So yeah, um, there were also there was this Snapchat, like it was like this the UW Snapchat. Facebook page or something like that, and so people would like would submit screenshotted Snapchats to it, and I showed up on there a few times. So people, <laughs> students would sit in class, take pictures of me lecturing, and like draw all over them <laughs> <laughs> and submit them to this. The Snapchat thing, first so. came out being supported in the military happens. and the company era. We had like a thousand Snapchats, and now like our CEOs like like suffer all over them. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Isn't there a scandal going on right now? <laughs> yeah, you should stop before we get to that stuff. Please. Yeah, when Snapchat first came out, it was not so fun and friendly. It was a lot of other stuff was happening on it. Um, anyways, yes, moving on. So, we had one more lecture on analytical transient response characteristics. And in the last lecture, we talked about how these um, transient response characteristics can be computed exactly for certain systems. And we introduced a couple of those systems, first order and then second order, neither of them with a zero in, in it. And we can compute those uh, like rise time, settling time, etc. Exactly. However, um, when you start scaling up from there, each system is unique and it can be very difficult to compute these things. As you can imagine, second order was is difficult. It gets even harder as you go up, and the math gets more difficult each time. So we stop trying to analytically compute it. Um, uh, from the transfer function. Instead, what we do is we say, well, it turns out that when your uh, system is higher order, or when it has zeros, uh, as long as it meets certain conditions, it still behaves like a second order system. So we need to um, uh, take a look at what those conditions are. So, Certain higher order systems can be approximated as second order systems and can be characterized by the parameters in the preceding section. So this was the um, natural frequency, damping ratio, that type of stuff. Yeah. How high of an order are we talking here? Uh, so there's really actually no limit to the order. You could have a 100th order, but as long as it meets these certain criteria. So it's as you go to higher order, it's Less likely that it'll meet these criteria. Um, I, mean, I mean, like, when would you like, like, at like ten, you cross over? Like, when would be like the crossover point? Well, the key really is so. It, say, ignoring zeros for a moment, the key is that all of the poles of, that create this higher order system um, are further out to the left. Are are have more negative real parts, um, and then the, if there are two dominant poles that are close to, closer to the imaginary axis, then um, even a very high order system can be approximated as a second order system. And the reason for that is that the, the uh, poles that show up way out on the left, um, 
they damp out, their transient responses damp out like, almost immediately, very, very quickly. Um, very large negative exponential uh, that, that dies away very quickly. So we don't have to worry about um, how high the order is really as long as all the poles are out of ways. So, and we'll talk about all, all the conditions here. Um, so, uh, higher order systems can be approximated to second order, and so can uh, uh, second order systems with zeros and higher order systems with zeros, which were not covered in the preceding two sections. So, these conditions um, for these approximations being valid are as follows higher order poles. Um, are, so this is one of the conditions. Higher order poles are much further into the left half plane um, than the dominant second order pair of poles. So a typical rule of thumb is five times. Now if I do um, if I was to draw that, that would look like this. So if you had some dominant pair of poles here, like here. They, they're dominant because they satisfy this condition. Um, if the next pole that you see uh, is like way out here, like on the real axis, or they can be off the real axis, another pole pair, um, these, ones don't, th these ones don't have as much of an effect on the transient response as these ones do, okay? And so these ones will dominate, so we call them dominant poles. Um, and the rule of thumb that's used is that if this distance um, is one-fifth of this distance, then it's a pretty good approximation. That was supposed to go from the axis. Um, so if this is 5x or better, we're good. I'm going to tell you now that, uh, that we will still use this approximation even if that is not valid. Um, and the reason, the reason for that is we don't really have another option for the design, starting for the design, um, besides just guessing. So we will still just use it, and it might not be very valid. We can check it later. So if you want to know if your approximation is valid, then you can check to make sure that the other poles are further out. Um, that's, that's one of the things you can do. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can simulate to see how good your assumption is. Right? And that's what we always do anyway. So we always, at the end, once we, once we do our analysis, we say, oh, there's a cer certain rise time or whatever that we, that we uh, specified, or a settling time that we specified. Well, that settling time or that rise time um, for the actual system is only going to be valid if this, this approximation is, is pretty valid, if the assumption is pretty valid. So if we do a simulation and we actually calculate what the rise time is or the settling time is, then we can find out if it was valid. I mean, that's the, 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 at the end of the day, the, the real test for validity is the simulation because um, this approximation is uh, always an approximation. So. All right, so uh, two. So that was the first condition. Second condition is closed loop zeros near the, the closed loop second order pole pair are nearly canceled by the close uh, by the close proximity of higher order closed loop poles. Okay. Um, so if we were to have so. Closed loop zeros near the closed loop second order pole pair are nearly canceled by the close proximity to higher order closed loop pole. So if we had like a zero here, um, this could screw things up for us. If you had a pole there, though, too, if it was close by, the eff net effect of those two, they nearly cancel. If they're right on top of each other, then they actually cancel. 
They don't affect stability, but they do affect the transient response. So yeah, so we're carrying. Well, so you're right. And for stability, it doesn't matter, but it does matter how the system responds. So with a zero, the system can respond much differently than without a zero. As we'll find out when we start doing, we're going to use that fact when we start building controllers. So that's we're going to stick zeros in there. So. Um, okay. So as long as it's close by, then the effects are, are canceled, and we can have this approximation hold. Um, the third condition is closed loop zeros not canceled by the close proximity of higher order uh, closed loop poles are far removed from the closed loop second order pole pair. So if we had zeros that are like out here, or like out here, or whatever, these ones don't have a huge effect either. So that's, those are our conditions. As long as those things hold, our approximation is good. Um, and we always check by simulating anyway. So we'll be able to, to make sure. This was more important. I mean, this is good for intuition as far as knowing when it's going to be valid or not. It was more important when we weren't going to simulate things because simulation was either expensive or not yet possible, but mostly just expensive. Okay, so let's sort of, uh, I guess, any questions on when we use the second order approximation of higher order systems, anything like that?